you know, there's a couple people, uh, two groups of people, like, kind of, uh, scrapping in the mall, if you will, just kind of, like, arguing and whatnot. And, um, you know, the dude's fighting another dude. And the one of the guy's friends comes up and tries to tries to just go for the guy. He uh, the, the, This much, much smaller guy just pulls out a knife, does the boom, like a stabbing motion right to the side of the neck. And it's so quick, you have to literally um, – go to like quarter speed to even see it. It was that quick. This guy was really, really quick. Um, and, and it wasn't even a slicing motion, which you would have expected at that speed. It was out, in, up, and out again, um, as opposed to a quick slice. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a puncture, boom. And the guy just starts, I mean, the guy's obviously not living anymore. back to Conversations from the Hearth. Today we are joined again by Sensei Ramsey Beach from Impulse Martial Arts out in Easton, Pennsylvania. Sensei Beach, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. So uh, last time you were on, we talked about a lot of things, but one thing we didn't talk too much about is weapons, and I thought that might be a, a great topic for today's discussion. So can you start out by telling us a little bit about your background with weapons um, to get us started? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so uh, um, I've dealt with a lot of weapons uh, in, uh, in my 20 years of training. Um, we've done everything from, um, well, so classically in the martial arts, uh, we did everything from the hombo, um, which is more like the three foot, two to three foot staff, um, tanbo, which is like, a, um, you know, like, like a one foot stick, if you will, um, joe staff, bow staff, um, uh, a lot of samurai sword, katana training. <clears throat> Um, and then uh, uh, we dealt with the the other classical weapons such as Sai and Kama, you know, uh, Nunchaku, but um, didn't really concentrate on those too much. Um, but we could talk about that a little bit, uh, Tanfa. So some of those um, um, uh, Okinawan weapons that that uh, most people don't uh, um, train regularly in the in the arts that I that I usually do. Um, just a reminder of the arts that I. Uh, was formerly trained in was uh, Aikido, uh, Kenpo, uh, ju Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Judo, um, as well as uh, just straight up uh, Samurai Sword, EI, and Kenjitsu. Sure. So that's a, that's a very widespread and probably helps you understand the nuances between the different weapons and different ways to use them. Uh, was there a, a kind of uniformity in approach amongst all those different disciplines, or was there some variance? Yeah, um, so what I've discovered, actually, uh, with weapons training in general, um, was that a lot of the weapons, you know, work hand in hand, and um, um, with your, combined with your empty hand training, the weapons training came that much easier. So uh, we never did competitions, we never did... Uh, um, I don't. I don't want to down green. You know, um, I don't want anybody to think that I'm, I'm making fun of or anything like that. But you know, we didn't. We didn't compete with weapons. We didn't do anything flashy, if you will. Uh, it was all just very practicalized and straight to the point. Um, um, and then, but there was there were some things that we would do just for drilling purposes, uh, like disarms and stuff like that, uh, that were relatively flashy uh now you know uh, in my experience I, I i noticed over time well these look really cool chances of you getting them off in an actual incident is is, is highly unlikely uh, but again we don't train all martial arts for the practicality we train for attribute building and uh, and for fun too as well um and uh, and for the art aspect of it uh, it also it also shines with yeah. some of these techniques but um but yeah i mean the speed coordination and all that that it all comes with it all comes with using the weapons but with the with the empty hand usage of uh, i'm sorry the empty hand portion of a martial art such as kempo for example um you know you're going to 
you're going to hold your hands up, um, like, let's say, in a fighting position or like this or what have you. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, the way you strike is the way you could strike with a knife or the way you, uh, you know, the way you chop down could be also with a, it's the same exact motion as if you're going to have a, a short stick. Yeah. Um, so so if you model, and now I know in, in um, Filipino martial arts, they're really big on knife and, you know, the short stick, the kali. So when they when they do their motions, they they do everything exactly the same. So it's the same it's the mm-hmm. same concept. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their their motion for a, a knife strike is the same thing as a stick strike. And um, um, when they do empty hand attacks, they do the they do the same kind of motions. So uh, that, that so was our martial arts aren't that much different from those martial arts, and even though the style is 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 vastly um, obviously different. I mean, that was one of my um, thoughts behind the question is, you know, <clears throat> Filipino martial arts, Okinawan Kobudo, these are both uh, based, derived from the open hand techniques uh, that form those closed hand weapon techniques. And yet they're very different. You know, the the, the way that Filipinos approach uh, their unarmed combat and their armed combat is much more fast paced, much more squared up with your opponent. Whereas, you know, Okinawa Kodo is a little bit more turned to the side, a little bit more um, one hit, one kill. And I'm not saying one is worse than the other. They're just very different. So when I when I hear, you know, I did Aikido and I did Jiu-Jitsu and I did, you know, Kempo, the way that you fight in these arts is quite different. And I wonder if that would affect the way that you would use the weapon, you know, much the same as... The difference between Okinawa Kobudo and you know Filipino martial arts. Okay. I am um, yeah. I'm I'm a believer. Like if 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 you um, if you train just an empty hand art for let's say um, the ten years and you you got pretty competent at it and uh, <clears throat> and I gave you an, uh, a knife for example and you've never touched a knife before. Or I give you a short stick, and you've never touched a short stick before. I'd be confident that 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 you would be able to do more with it than than had you not had that training. Um, and I said, here, just pretend you're doing, you know, kempo or tang sudo or whatever whatever art you're doing, and then um, you'd be able to apply it a little easier. Um, with, with that said, though, uh, weapons do have other uh, um, uh, techniques to them that aren't present in in empty hand attacks right so uh, there's things that you would do let's say with a samurai sword that you would never do empty hand there's no empty hand equivalent mm-hmm. and um uh, that's just because we're utilizing the blade you know um there's times where we put the blade against the body and we do a slicing motion and come back just because we're close distance you know close proximity um uh, and there's no there's really no equivalent for empty hand striking uh, in that manner uh, that would do something effective at least obviously with the blade it's a tool so it's an extension of your body um, yeah. and it gives you a distinct advantage so you know being in close and being able to slice is great um but empty hands you could put your hand there maybe slice in but it, it might it might prepare you for for uh you know getting a grip or something like that but not necessarily going to be doing anything immediate damage such as you know, the slicing motion so so there's stuff like that um well um, it's it's it- it's interesting because as martial artists, we learn how to generate power with our body uh, really well. And so like, I'll, you know, go work with my friend, like chopping wood and I'll like, I, I actually, this has just happened to me fairly recently, you know, some years back, I went to start chopping wood with my brother up in our cabin in Vermont. And I'm like a chopping master, even though I've never really chopped that much wood, just because right. I know how to like generate a lot of power with my, my body. And, and like, I'm like a master shoveler, you know, because I know how to generate power with my body. And, um, but there's certain kinds of power that is not so transferable. Like, for example, the slicing motion of a sword is a little bit different than the chopping motion of an axe. And you don't really slice, I mean, we call it knife hand, but we don't really slice with it, you know? And so that slicing motion is a little bit different biomechanic. Um, so you like just agree with what you're saying like there's definitely some things that transfer 
And then there's some things that are sort of unique aspects um, that you can only learn if you actually pick up that weapon. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned the axe thing. Um, I've never chopped wood myself. Uh, I live in Pennsylvania, but uh, not in a rural area, so I don't I don't chop wood regularly uh, or at all. Um, but the uh, I went to a uh, what's it called? Just a like a like an amusement park, and they had one of those big things, you know, with the hammer, and you have to ping, you know. And um, uh, I was like, I've never done this before, ever. But yeah. you know what? I've been like this was just maybe like you know three or four years ago, and I've never done it before. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm pretty sure I can do this. Let's do it. You know, I'm I'm a big guy. I'm six three. I can I can do this. Um, so I went up to it and and just put everything I had, every martial arts training bit that I possibly had, whether it was an up and down sword. You know, some of the some of the weapons you use, like Naganata and bow, they're so long that you have to use different leverages with yeah. your hands and everything. You know what I mean? The longer the weapon, the, the different your grips have to be and the way you have to move your body. But so I just picked this thing up and it's very bulky and top heavy or just it's not very, uh, very um, efficient to use. But, you know, I pick it up and I just put my whole body into it. I jump, I use my hips, I crunch, I, I jump, I do everything. And I just I just smash the crap out of it. And um, and I, I did pretty well. I did pretty well. I did win. Um, but there are times where I've tried it again and you hit it, you're off just a little bit, just a little just, bit, and it doesn't register and you just feel like, oh, wow, yeah. hold on a second, hold on a second, how, how did I mess that one up? Yeah, like, I, I hit that thing so hard because you were off just a little bit. You know, happens, that, you know, that big guy go up with that, you know, that girl and he's like, yeah, let me show you how this is done, baby. Yeah, and then that's he right. hits it and it barely goes up and it's just like, when the guy comes out, he's like, let me show you how it's done. And the guy's like all scrawny and lanky and he used one arm and he, Gets it to go all the way to the top. I think there's some trick. I can't remember if it's you need to hit totally flat or you need to hit on a bit of an angle or something. But somebody told me that there was there was definitely a trick to it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you a little story myself. I've always seen those punching bag things, mm -hmm. but I I've never really. I was like, oh man, is this like a trick too? Because if I punch this thing and I don't like get like top <laughs> score, I'm going to be humiliated. You know? Yeah. I was at a birthday party with my five-year-old son and in front of all of his friends like hey punch the bag punch the bag and i'm like oh my god if i don't do this uh my son's not gonna like have any respect to this class but if i do this then all the kids are gonna like you know show him some respect so i was like all right and i got apparently i don't know what the highest score is but it was like we're all champions oh. it was, it was it, i hit it really hard but i was worried I was worried that like it, it wouldn't work and I'd be humiliated. Yeah. So what'd you end up getting? I'm curious. I can't remember. I can't remember what the score was. If there was a score, it just said like world champion. Blah, 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 blah. So, like, oh, okay. um, Wasn't like a pressure per square inch type thing. Like, some of the like it, it sort of like mocks you. So if you, if you hit it low, it'd be like, you know, you weak lean or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right, right. It's really, really grandiose like that. I can't remember. Um, and, and again, yeah, I, I, I've seen, I've seen uh, social media videos where, where people do that, and some, some people as small as like, like a maybe a, a smaller looking female, um, will just whack it really, really hard and get like a super high score, and you're like, okay, you know, I'll make you a sandwich, no problem, you know, and then, um, you know, know uh, and, and some, some, some big guy goes up and he hits it, and it's like, woo. And uh, you're like, okay, well, obviously she has great technique. She's very good at what she does. And he probably never even hit a bag before, you know? Yeah. The thing that I was surprised by, I like laid in that thing super duper hard. It was incredible. But it was so soft. And it just went, whoop. And I was wow. expecting it to be like hitting like a wave master mm -hmm. or heavy bag or something. And I was like, you know, bracing my, my arm and like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slam this thing. And I was like, boom. And it, just like, it was just like nothing, you know? It was right. Like punching over one of those blow up uh, ghosts or something at Halloween, you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's just yeah. Maybe it's just absolutely just testing how much power you got in overall. But again, I think uh, with some of those machines, um, if you hit it just off the mark a little bit, you'll probably just not generate the power you need, and it'll angle off, and then now you look you look horrible. Have you ever heard of a Sarabi? There, there are unless you grew up in the nineties and we're trading them. Which I'm sure you were. Uh, uh, I I I um I uh, I I don't I, if uh, I don't recognize the term to be honest with you. So my my master was so excited one day. He's like, "Yeah, I got us a sarabi." It was like the first 
now there's a lot of stuff like that. Like in Taekwondo, they have all electronic hogus and things. But at the time, there was nothing like that. And this was like the first thing to come out. It was probably in the mid-90s. And he literally put it at the head of the class. Like he had like bolted it to the ground and it had all his arms and legs. And you would you could fight with it and like had all his uh, padded pressure plates. And when you hit the pressure plate, it would tell you like how strong you were and there was like mm. games where it would like light up and you have to kick it and see how fast you were and uh that was a lot of fun and i ended up doing very well i can't remember what my score was but i was like besides my master i was second place in the school so i felt real that sounds great that. <laughs> well that sounds like a good time <laughs> cool. um yeah. anyway so with the with the weapons um um <clears throat> one one thing that that we've uh trained um uh, d during during my time has been uh, you know knife and uh, like short blades what um uh, what I wanted to say about knives is uh um, I I'm, I'm a firm believer that that because knives are so realistic and so common in the world today um I, I think just as much as the swords were back in feudal Japan mm -hmm. um, um, maybe they weren't as common as we think, but uh, but uh, <laughs> common enough for where they would want to train them and uh, you know work disarms and stuff like that. Again, some of the disarms we we work on aren't 100% practical, and I realize that being more experienced, I say you know what you'll never get in this situation, but it teaches you this, teaches you that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I like taking it for what it is. However, um. And it looks really cool sometimes. But mm -hmm. with knife training, uh, one one aspect that I've always noticed is is with knives being so prevalent in society today, I am now um, um, uh, somebody who teaches knife only in the most practical aspect because it's such a real thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that if you're going to train knife, any kind of a knife attack, any kind of knife... Um, defense specifically it should be in probably the most real manner um and this is and this is also why uh it's such a small weapon it can be really small here it could be a nice big long you know um uh, machete type knife right but but uh, most knives are going to be you know small they're gonna be daggers mm -hmm. so when we're when we're training knife um, because of that aspect it's so easy to manipulate and so quick Mm -hmm. and it's often hidden and you have no idea you even have you're in a knife fight until you have it jammed inside your uh your body uh or you have a nice slice on your hand or whatever or you lose a finger um by that time uh a lot of the techniques that we see especially in aikido um people will come out with the knife in a in a very casual manner and uh, you'll 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 turn around you'll do this beautiful wrist twist you know, kurigaishi takedown and all this stuff um you know, somebody will come at you with the psycho stab. You do this nice, beautiful uh, koshinage or something to throw them over or whatever. And um, the reason I, I I disagree with that kind of training is because it tells it tells the the person that you're working with, the person doing the technique, that it's okay to approach a knife as a casual weapon, as a blunt object when it's not. You know, um, if somebody has a stick, you can try those things all day. You know, worst thing you can do is get a bump on the head, right? Unless the person really, really knows what they're doing with a, with a bat or a short stick. You know, if you're trained, I don't think you have to worry about it anywhere near as much as a knife. But you can give a knife to a, to a, a, a very weak-looking person, very slow-looking person. They're going to be able to do a lot of damage with it, potentially. Um, so I think it's I think it's important that we... We, we focus on knife training across all martial arts um, as the uh, knife-focused martial arts do. And that's with 100% reality, um, no flashy stuff, do what works. You know, if you need to pin it down, pin it down. Um, uh, I think the reason most people don't do that is because it takes away 90, 95% of all of your martial arts training. You know, all the flashy stuff, all of the, um, the fun stuff that we like to do so much. Um, uh, you know, and I've seen, I've seen, uh, very respectable people train knife before and, and I go, well, that's not a knife attack. So, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't appreciate people attacking other people with a knife in an 
unrealistic manner. You know, uh, we got the sewing machine where people do that really fast. We have these really tight in tight slices. You know, people don't run at you like, ooh, big, wild attacks. Um, you know, people don't go up to you and go, hey, man, give me your money. You know, and they, they do this hesitantly, right? It, it's, it's usually right up to you um, or in your face or it's inside you already, you know, or it's, on, it's next to your throat. It's just in, in a very real position and it becomes real, really quick. And if you don't train that way um, and you've only ever trained and you got a big head or you got, um, you got a, a little overconfident knowing, oh, I've, I've trained that before. I can handle that. And then you get put into a real situation. I, think, I just think that's going backwards. Um, and a lot of people get humili uh, not humiliated, um, humbled uh, when they when they say or when they do knife stuff and then you do something as simple as pull it back out of the way and they can't do their technique, you know. So I don't know. What, what were your thoughts on, uh, on knife training specifically? I agree with you. I mean, I think what we try to do here with everything is start with the most applicable and then work our way up. I think the demo and the more specialized techniques can have a place you know higher up on the stack you know for higher ranks once they've mastered those basics but i agree it's just stick with the basics and i think for something as common as a knife like learning that um is a very important skill to have i will also say and i have done not i've not focused on knife but i have uh done knife training over the years <clears throat> And I've done very realistic knife training. I mean, I've I've done marker knives where you get in there and you're marking each other and you don't want to get marked and all sorts of stuff like that. But I will tell you, and I'm and I probably feel like you agree with this, it's actually ridiculously hard to defend against a knife. And hundred percent. Only ones that you're gonna really be able to like block and counter in a really succinct, clean way are those exaggerated strikes you someone coming in like this you you're there's not a lot you're going to be able to do you're going to basically go for the knife and try to get a hold of it and you might get stabbed a few times in the process but if i was going to do a demonstration in front of people i wouldn't want you to come in at me like like this and i just you know react and, and somehow get a hold of that knife you probably would hit me like one or two times before i get a hold of that knife and then once right. I got a hold of the knife, it would be like I was fighting a crocodile. I'd be locked onto your hand so that you couldn't get it out and put it in your other hand or whatever. And then I would start doing my wrist locks or whatever I needed to do to take you down. But that process of getting hold of the knife against a trained knife expert would be incredibly dangerous. But listen, yes. that's why people have knives. It's better than your hand. It's a lot better than your hand. It's now, easy. another thing to remember is that most people aren't trained experts who do wield knives. 80% of people who get attacked with a knife, this is a statistic I heard. I, I haven't had it backed up or anything, but this is what I heard. I think it was Tony Blauer, who's an expert, a really top tier expert. 80% of people who get attacked by knives don't even know they're being attacked by someone wielding a knife. So that's why a lot of the, the basic defenses that we learn against punches and kicks apply well for a knife because you really just do not even know and it's another reason to be very careful of grappling because when you go from striking range in the grappling range uh if the person has a knife you're in big trouble because that's where they want to be knife fighting yeah. is all close in it's more slashing than striking it i mean it is being you know, striking too but um a lot can be accomplished in a very short space and that's something that a lot of people don't realize and so and then also the reason everyone loves covering these days, right? Because of MMA, you have to get a cover. Covering is the worst thing you can do against a weapon, right? Covering only works against like a, a soft, squishy, impacting object like a fist or an elbow or a leg. It's not, it, it, it dampens the strike. But if something is so powerful that dampening is not enough, like a sword, like a knife, that's sharp, it's going to cut through whatever it hits. You have to block the arm holding the weapon or you're not going to be able to stop it at all so um and you know there's there's just all these realities that people need to be aware of like for example a weapon's reach is a humongous advantage right and you can't for some weapons like maybe like a bow or an extremely you might be able to actually 
get a hold of the weapon with your hand, but for most, you have to go inside the range of the weapon and get to the arm and or, or the wrist or whatever. And that means that you have to move so fast that you clear that distance. So what that means is you have to wait for them to be off balance so far that the time it would take for them to come back, you can clear the distance and get inside. And so what I tell a lot of my students is, yeah, we want to learn realistic self-defense and we want to we, we want to attack like this. But if the person is just going like this all the time, you're kind of in a bunch of, of, of uh, poo-poo. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. And so right. waiting for that person to make an exaggerated swing, you know, then they're going to do it. They're hopped up on adrenaline and they're attacking fast and, and, and going all over the place. Maybe they start to slip and they go down like this. That's your moment to go in. But until that happens, you stay outside. You use your footwork and evasion. And let them just go all flurry like this. You you move around. You let them exhaust themselves. You let them make that mistake, and that's when you can go in. But if you go in any sooner than that, you're just you're going to get slaughtered, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and I like the the fact that you pointed out that most people aren't trained. And uh, I think I think we should all be thankful that most people out there that are probably going to attack somebody else uh, maliciously and without cause, um, uh, or in a criminal way is just not trained and they have no idea what they're doing. And that's the advantage. It's, it's highly unlikely, you know, in my eye that um, somebody uh, like you and I, you know, or, or Jesse um, are going to go out there and uh, be trained in something and, and pick a fight uh, with a weapon or without a weapon. Um, so um, a lot of people are always saying, Oh, well, that's not realistic or, um, you know, that would never happen or this or that or whatever, but they don't realize that chances are, if you get into a fight, if you get into a self-defense scenario, um, you're going to be in a defense scenario with somebody who probably doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, and if they did, something went wrong with their training a long time ago. You know, it's like it's like the person you went to school with the same amount of time, you know, turns heel and then you have to fight them in the in the, in the final scene of the movie, you know. Um, so that, that's rare. You don't have to fight people that are of high caliber. Um, unless they're, unless they're just naturally aggressive, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I agree with that. And so, so, so running in, um, and finding, getting into a knife fight with somebody who knows what they're doing is, is, is probably, uh, unlikely. Uh, but that, that sometimes that even makes them more dangerous where they're just, they're just wildly going and, and everybody knows how to stab. Everybody knows how to do a quick slice. Um, uh, so in response to that, I think a lot of people also don't realize <clears throat> that the number one defense against, um, any kind of a weapon is not being close enough so the person can use their weapon, you yeah. know, um, and, and, and make them not voluntarily, of course, but, but you have to force them to close the distance. And um, uh, while they close the distance, if they get within your comfort range or within your my eye or your, your proper distancing, um, you know, if assuming you have to engage, engage with a level of force that's equivalent, like your own knife or, you know, some other protective measure, like, a, you know, uh, that's what that's what the hombo or the, you know, Kali sticks are great for, um, you know, closing, uh, uh, closing the distance and using that to, uh, in, in Filipino, they call it defanging the snake where they, they, uh, you know, they whack the hand and hopefully knock the, the weapon out or break the hand so they can't use it, et cetera. Um, so, so, uh, you know, closing that distance with, a, with an advantage, great. And if you're empty hand too, um, and you have nothing on your on your person that you can defend with. Yeah, like you said, there's there's good timing, there's bad timing, but um, you know, enter in and just do what you need to do to to, to neutralize it. And there's some universal ways of doing that, uh, but nothing works against mm -hmm. everything. So, uh, but yeah, that's a great yeah, thing. And I exactly. and I think the the conversation still still is the same about uh, firearms as well. You know, nobody's walking around with AKs. Um, so we don't have to worry about high-powered rifles being uh, regularly available on the street for um, you know, the defense purposes. Um, but there is a, a ton of handguns, most of them being involved in um, um, uh, um, conflict, um, you know, like criminal conflict. They're usually illegal. There's usually not a, uh, a legal firearm out there that's being used to, to rob a bank or to, you know, hold somebody up. Right. Uh, but but again, we have untrained people coming up to you and, and using a firearm. <coughs> yeah. Again, people 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 like to approach um, a knife and a firearm as 
well, here, here's how we disarm. Here's how we do this over do that. But they also don't, I don't, I don't think personally from, from my studies, I don't think that, that a lot of the instructors um, will necessarily promote, get the hell out of there as soon as you can. If you know they have a knife, disengage and be gone unless you have to engage for whatever reason. You know, maybe they're in your house and you have to protect your family, whatever. Um, uh, same thing with a firearm. If you don't have to disengage, do not because um, that's going to be a, a bullet going across your chin or up your head or, you yeah. know, into your gut and you don't know and adrenaline's going. Um, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that we see on TV. Uh, but once you train it, you'll you'll realize, hey, um, crap, I probably would have gotten shot, you know? Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, people react. So if I'm untrained and I hold a gun to you and you you try to disarm me, yeah, maybe you'll get it. But if we did it 10 times in a row, um, very few out of those times would you actually get, it. I'm going to maybe move to the side. Maybe I'll move it just a little bit and you miss it. You know, um, you know, maybe I'll pull away because people are, you know, you, somebody with a gun comes up to you and you try to uh, counter attack them right away. They're going to be pulling back and protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you scramble for the gun. It could go off. So uh, a lot of bad things can happen with a gun, just like with a knife. Um, so I think it's really important. People understand that, you know, counter attacking and disarming is not, it's not anybody's priority um, uh, necessarily. You know, I like to look at it like this. Um, a gun and a knife is a humongous advantage. And you could say, well, it's just an insurmountable odd. And so we're not even going to take our time to approach it. And in that situation, just run. But that's not always going to work either. And nope. that's not going to instill confidence. That's not going to build people up and, and feel like they have something at least something in that tool chest that they could rely on if they absolutely had to absolutely there's been so many uh so much mistrust in the martial arts community and it's been highlighted by a few eccentrics who are probably just super delusional and couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag and they get posted up on youtube or something and so they're they're like the guy's got the gun and they're all like doing some little dance and then they like do this little thing and and everyone says, oh, yeah, that guy would have been dead, you know, like in one second. And that's totally true. But we I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so a lot of people think that that's how all the schools are out there. And that's how they're all doing their gun and knife defenses. I'll tell you, I've been to over 30 martial arts schools growing up in martial arts before I even became a, uh, like a school owner and, and was networking and meeting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of maybe thousands of martial artists all over, not just America, but it back in Korea. And no one teaches like that. Nobody. No, like, you know, the places where I learned my gun defenses and my knife defenses, my instructors told me straight up, like, this is very unlikely to work. And you, this is just like a last resort, you know, self-defense, uh, um, situation if you had to if there was no option to run then you know and you have to fight do it you know i we just did our price training and the first is uh what is it add evade uh oh, deny uh defend right and so you know you run away you hide you lock the door you turn off the lights and somebody coming after you and somehow they break into the door that's when you grab you grab the gun and you wrestle it from them. Okay, that's the situation we're talking about. We're talking about at the very very end. There's nothing else to do. There's nowhere to go, and you can't just give them the money and expect them to leave. That's when you're going to use these skills. And it's like, okay, I I have spent a lot of time learning grappling, and after 20 years of studying grappling, um, all sorts of disciplines, hapkido, judo, jiu-jitsu there are positions that and things you can put me in that I'm like, hmm, yeah, I tap. <laughs> there, there's nothing I can really do. There's nothing really I can really do. Once you get that, that far in and you're in that position, I'm going to tap. And I'll tell you what, that's why all the experienced grapplers, when you get the arm bar locked out and it's in the perfect position and everything's lined up and your knees are in, they just tap. They don't wait for it to go snap. They tap, but all the white belts, they, they're, they're all locked up and, they're, and then they don't tap and then they go, oh, you hurt me. It's like, yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, yeah. Five seconds before, right? And mm -hmm. so there are things that you are beyond your ability. But even in those situations, there are things you can try. The things that like my my presenting jiu jitsu instructor will show me, and I'm like, I'm not really getting it to work. And he's like, Yeah, you know, this guy's like stronger than you, and he's got it really locked up tight. And you would have needed to get it like two seconds before he got so tight. Like if you could have gotten it just a couple seconds before when he was kind of locking his legs together, you might have been able to get this to work. And it's like, that's what we're talking about here with gun defenses. That's what we're talking about with knife defenses. Right. We're talking right. about those, those small windows of opportunity that you're going to have to maximally exploit in order to get a hold of that weapon and disarm that person. And that's, just the big fallacy of the martial arts in general. You know, you get these, I don't want to insult anybody here, but I feel like people need to be honest with themselves. You get these people who come in that are out of shape and overweight, very small, and they expect to take out these jacked, in shape men who are like six foot five. And it's like, you're just out of touch. You're just totally out of touch with reality, guys. There mm -hmm. are limits, you know. A lot of fighting is mental and a lot of fighting is fitness. And then there's some skill in there. But if I put the skill in the wedge, it might be like 30%, okay? And with that 30%, if you're really good at this, you can kind of expand it out, you know? You can expand it out so that you can beat people who are a lot bigger and stronger than you. But if you if you don't look at it like that, if you think like, you know, oh yeah, I can I can throw a punch and I can, you know, do some something like this, you're just going to get annihilated. And yeah. most people just kind of go through life with the delusion of what they're actually capable of. And they don't realize reality. I mean, that was a big thing in our training that we just did was just talking, trying to talk to people and press upon them, like what reality looks like. Um, hmm. so. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, um, you know, speed, uh, age, um, skill, you know, athleticism, um, strength, weight, all that stuff plays a role. And, and, uh, that's why they have, uh, weight and age classes in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournaments, you know, um, they have weight classes in MMA tournaments. Um, um, you know, cause 40 year old, uh, purple belt in the BJJ is, is not equivalent to a 20 year old purple belt in BJJ. Um, I mean, they might be on some levels, but in, in many other aspects, no, they're just uh, on average, they're probably not going to be. Hence the reason for some age groups, um, well, discrepancy for stuff like that. So you can have yeah, a skill, so. skill and, and lose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. That, that can yeah. happen to people. I want you to understand that. Like, that's right. You lose doesn't mean you're worse than them. Okay. I, I had a instructor I used to train under and he had a rule. He's like, if you're, if you're this age, you can get this rank. If you're this age, you can get this rank. And it was the first time I encountered that. I come from other schools that allowed me to get these ranks before then. And I really felt like I earned them because I was like very, very serious about martial arts. I never wanted to um, do cartoon martial arts. I wanted to be like Bruce Lee and I trained really hard. And I pushed myself. And, you know, he's like, you can't be a black belt unless you're an adult and even in our school we we do junior black belts for kids but we allow them to have it but here was my rationale to him and i think it's something that a lot of people haven't thought all the way through so the reason why i do junior black belts is that a kid may not understand all the ramifications of being a black belt and it seems a little a little um premature to be calling them mr so-and-so when they're like 12 years old but Otherwise, they have basically the same knowledge as a black belt. And so I feel it's fair to give them a black belt. But in a lot of schools that say you can't get a black belt, um, their rationale as well, they're just not, they're not physically, you know, uh, badass enough to earn that rank. And I say, okay, so are you saying that if you're a, a woman, you can only get this high? And if you're a man, you can get this high? Because... The woman's maximum potential is lower than a man's. And if you're this tall, your maximum potential is lower than if you're this tall. And if you're this strong, it's lower than this person. And if you actually start looking at things like that, what is your maximum potential? Then 
you're going to have to start ranking like everybody else, like yellow and green belts, you know, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of people are small. A lot of people are, are women who are coming to our schools and looking for martial arts training. And for me, rank is about knowledge, okay, and ability. If they if they can throw a good punch and they know a lot of techniques and they have had a lot of experience on the mats, that's what qualifies them for getting that rank. And they can have all those things. And then they get out there and they're fighting a guy who's six five and his leg is like as long as their entire body. And as they go in every single time, they get hit by the leg and they can't get through it, you know? That has a huge advantage. That is just innately has a huge advantage. And that doesn't mean that, you know, Jesse, who's 6'5", gets to be a black belt while the, the five foot, you know, lady over here, she can only get her green belt or whatever it might be. Um, so, I, I, you know... Yeah, so so when we throw that in with weapons, I mean, um, you know, now now uh, now we can take some of that disadvantage away, you know. So um, yeah, I, I've seen I've seen um, uh, this is one video that's out there. Uh, I don't know how you can find it. Uh, I don't think it's on YouTube anymore, but <clears throat> it was pretty graphic. Um, it looked like it was in like South America somewhere. I don't know if it was Brazil or whatever. Anyways, um, you know, there's a couple people, uh, two groups of people like. Kind of uh, scrapping in the mall, if you will, just kind of like arguing and whatnot. And um, you know, the dude's fighting another dude, and the one of the guy's friends comes up and tries to tries to just go for the guy. He uh, the the this much much smaller guy just pulls out a knife, does the boom like a stabbing motion right to the side of the neck, and it's so quick you have to literally. Um, go to like quarter speed to even see it. It was that quick. This guy was really, really quick. Um, and, and it wasn't even a slicing motion, which you would have expected at that speed. It was out, in, up, and out again, um, as opposed to a quick slice. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a puncture, boom. And the guy just starts, I mean, the guy's obviously not living anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, and he's, he's just, he's <clears throat> he's squirting out of his neck. His karate is probably severed. The guy's done. Um, and he doesn't know what's going on, but, but watching a video like that <clears throat> just opens up your eyes as to how quick a knife attack can happen. And then, you know, that, I mean, that guy could have theoretically been, you know, more experienced than you and I combined and it wouldn't have done him anything, you know, um, yeah. had he just kept his distance and not approached. Um, the other thing is I think he actually knew he had a knife. I think the knife was obviously readily visible um but but either way <clears throat> so in that instance don't approach somebody with a knife unless you have to maybe it's your job maybe you need to take them down for some other reason um but but if you're going to approach somebody with another weapon um use an equalizer uh that is of, of similar force you know if they have a knife at least grab a knife you know unless you know how to use a baton um you know if they have a gun you should have a gun as well uh, that would be really good <clears throat> um so with gun training as well um you know that there's there's not a lot of really good gun training out there and i think i think gun training is uh, important for anybody who wants to to learn how to or who's going to carry a gun and um the concealed or even just any kind of a gun operation courses that i've come across they're just so subpar and just impractical um, they teach you how to shoot. Uh, I don't know. Do you do you, uh, do you carry or do you shoot uh, regularly at all? I mean, I have guns that yes. I shoot them, but I don't. Um, I wouldn't like. I don't go like every week to the range or something. And, oh, sure, yeah, yeah. So you know, the, I mean, the courses that are out there, you know, it's it's it, you know, you pull out your gun, you do your you do your isosceles stance. You know, maybe even they even teach you how to quote unquote move and shoot. And they advertise these things like it's um, what do they call it? Uh, um, like self, def like I don't know, like self defense firearms training or something like that. Like how to use it defensively. Mm -hmm. And for lack of better terms, it's it's bullshit. You know, um, and the reason is uh, because if you're going to be in a gun, like if you want to, if you see a, I don't know, somebody's in your house and you want to approach them, you know, with your firearm and you. Oh, I think we lost you, sir. We lost the audio. Oh, yeah. um, uh, you could probably use it in that instance. 
But 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 other than that, can you guys still see me? You're frozen on the screen. We can hear your voice. I don't know what happened. Oh, there okay. you're back. You're back. We got uh, I'm back. Oh, and I have the combination. All right. Um. So. So um. You know they they teach these these methods where it's just move and shoot. You know stuff like that. Um. You know how to shoot around corners, but. But, um, you know, gunfights, again, they're not realistic like that. They don't happen like that. Um, you know, you, you're in a you're in a, a spiff with somebody, maybe just, hey, man, why'd you park in my parking spot? Whatever. And then for some reason, they had a bad day and you pissed them off. I'm just shooting out a really bogus example. But uh, out of nowhere, they just they pull out their gun. And it's like, OK, well, now I have to pull out my gun. Otherwise, I'm potentially screwed. Uh, you know, I'm going to get shot. Uh, you know, assuming you feel the, the need to do that, and uh, then how are they going to pull it out? Are they going to just pull it out and stand there in a triangle? You know, maybe move side to side? Uh, no, you're not going to do that. Um, so, so it's important for people uh, who who are watching this and who, who who want to be able to use their firearm properly in a real situation um, or a more pro highly probable situation. Um, where the gunfight starts within a three to 10 foot distance, as opposed to, you know, on the other side of the house or in a mall or something like that, <clears throat> where you can approach like a, like a police officer would approach. Yeah. And uh, so you're going to have to learn how to move and shoot uh, from different angles, you know, shoot over your shoulder, shoot from the back, you know, shoot while you're running away, um, all while avoiding and watching out for obstacles and, um, uh, you know, observing where other people are, so you don't shoot some innocent bystander in the face uh, while they're while they're running away. You know, so there's all these aspects that a lot of these basic pistol defense courses, uh, from from what I've seen and uh, uh, experienced, just don't don't offer. They all just offer yeah. hey, how to point and shoot and how to how to maybe maybe move your feet just a little bit um, to do that. I'll, I'll it goes into the mentality of of let's train for reality um you know i i think a monkey could grab a gun point it at a target and shoot yeah. i think a monkey could point it at a target and then walk a little bit and shoot while they're walking <laughs> that's not that's not an acquired skill sure. i think anybody can do that my wife is not athletic at all and she can do that with yeah. with and i have way more training than her and then mm -hmm. she can do that no problem um yeah. So, so what are they really teaching? I think they're just teaching normal everyday skills, point and shoot. We can all do that. Um, but, but, but learning how to get out of dodge, learning how to prevent being shot, learning how to um, uh, shoot while moving in a circular pattern, stuff like that. There's a, there's a cool video that um, somebody posted and uh, it was, a, it was a police officer approaching someone with a knife and uh, the, the attacker started lunging at him. And he pulled out his gun. He shot in a very um, uh, uh, non-typical stance. He's running and shooting at the same time over his shoulder, behind his back. and But he's circling the guy. And eventually he, he, he hit him probably like eight or nine times. But it took him you know, 10 to 12 seconds to drop and be neutralized. And, and people, people don't realize that it takes time for somebody to get – it's not like the movie's – you, know, you get shot in the head, boom, point blank, you're probably going to fall down, right? You get shot in the heart, point blank, yeah, you could probably fall down with a high enough caliber. But but most of the time, they're just going to keep blood pumping, keep moving for five to ten seconds and keep chasing you, yeah. you know? So so we have to be on the move. We have to we have to understand the, the realism behind uh, firearms training and, and being able to utilize firearms while somebody's attacking you. So, yeah. So. You know, we should bring him back on and talk to Master Chance Fine because he was saying a lot of the same things as you last time we talked to him. And I've heard that from a lot of different sources. I personally haven't taken any uh, gun courses, but I hear that they're pretty pathetic. And I can imagine, you know, when I went to college to study teaching, all of my courses were like about teaching law. And I was like, but then like, how do I like learn how to teach and no one really taught me that in college and I learned more from teaching from my master in Taekwondo than I ever learned from going to school for education which is hilarious that's that's funny and I think that is 
what happens with like everything you know once it becomes sort of institutionalized a lot of times they're just worried about their liability and that's probably also why they don't do a lot of the running the running gunning stuff which probably they're like oh my god you know this is totally gonna get shot or whatnot but you know i think you like master chance fine because he was talking about how he gets in front of them and they gotta hit the target and get them all worn out and then he jumps to the side and they shoot the target you know and he does a lot of this kind of intensive you know, a little bit dangerous um, uh, gun training, but he thinks it's important because it simulates reality. And I agree. I mean, I agree with you guys for sure. Um, so I would also say this, and this is something I thought of when you started talking, is it if your uh, confidence is based on your ability to defend yourself, you never truly be confident. It's something that I tell my students all the time. Like your confidence should come from somewhere else because – at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how skilled of a martial artist you are, like you said, someone can come up and shiv you in the neck when you're not paying attention and you're dead, okay? You could have like a Sherman tank parked outside your house. If you can't get to your tank, you're dead. You could have a gun right next to your bed loaded on the nightstand, which your son could come and just pick up and shoot you with, you know, by accident. And if you're asleep, and somebody slits your throat when you're sleeping, you're dead, okay? So there's just like, there's no way to defend against everything. And mm -hmm. another thing that's really important to remember, though, is awareness is everything. Yeah. Now, I don't like to talk about video games too much, but I will say one thing. One of the things, I remember back in the day, Counter-Strike became a really popular game. And it was like one of the first first-person shooter gunning games that became popular. And one of the things that everyone figured out was that awareness was more important than accuracy. And that was something we never thought was going to be that important. And it's like the most important thing, like how you move through a level and, and where you're looking is so, so, so important. Mm -hmm. And that is true in life too. Mm -hmm. So if you're aware of a threat, even if they do have a gun on them, even if they do have a knife on them, if you're aware of them targeting you as an assailant from 30 feet away, then even if they pull their gun out from 30 feet away, you're probably already moving to cover yes, and you're going to be in a safe place. So if you're if you're really worried about knife and gun and all these other weapons that really change the, the playing field, the best defense you can do is just increase your awareness, increase your, your – think about your situation. You know, when you go into a diner – don't sit with your back to the door, know where the exits are, you know, run through scenarios that you can employ if you did get attacked, mm -hmm. because that's what's going to save you more than anything if if the uh, the balance of power has been tipped so far by a weapon. Right, right. And I like what you said about the, the confidence. Um, you know, a lot of people can become very confident by the, with their abilities, you know, they could be really good at something. You know, uh, whether it be grappling or stand-up martial art, boxing, stuff like that. You can be really, really good at what you do um, and get rewarded via um, sports, you know. So there's a lot of the sport. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, well, Mike Tyson. You don't want to get into a fight with Mike Tyson, right? Yeah, but Mike Tyson's a striker. You know what I mean? He doesn't kick. He doesn't have range because he's short. And he and he doesn't know how to grapple, you know. Um, so I... I, I'm not going to say I want to fight Mike Tyson, but I think if I was locked in a cage with him, I'd have a chance at least, you know what I mean? Just don't get hit by him, you know? Um, so, so, uh, you know, be aware of, of what his strengths are and weaknesses are. Right. And, um, and, but same thing, like, uh, you know, we never want to get overconfident and say, you know what? I've trained knife. I've trained gun. I've trained baton. I know what to do. I'm going to do it. Um, that's a different, that's a whole different story. Um, uh, you could be really, really trained and, and, and confident like that. Uh, but even, <clears throat> even the most skilled practitioners that I know, they all say the same thing. Like you had mentioned, like, like you're like, they're really good people. You do not want to mess with uh, from any aspect and same thing. Like just get out, just don't be there. Um, use your awareness. Uh, um, Try to avoid the situation at all costs, and I've I've learned from that. I, I like uh, to tell, sorry, I like to tell people match match power for power. If someone comes at you with a punch, you know, defend yourself with your hands and your feet. 
if someone comes at you with a weapon, evade, retreat, get your gun and shoot them in the head. I mean, like, you don't, you know, like, that's, what, you know, match their power. If they come at you with a knife, evade, pick up a chair, use a chair, you know. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of weapons all around you that you never even think about that you can use to defend yourself. And, um, you know, use those. Yeah. Just really quick, touching back on that uh, that confidence thing, uh, you know, being really good doesn't mean that you're, you're you should necessarily just run head into a situation. Um, and you, so this is all about mentality, right? So mentality for a knife or a gun situation, we're talking self-defense, right? So uh, if something's going to happen instinctually, that's going to be way more self-defense oriented than um, had you be able to back up. You have the opportunity to run away um, or at least clear distance. And then you have to think, okay, you know what? I, I can run away, but I'm going to a attack this guy anyways that is what i consider confidence um um you know being being overconfident and saying you know what i i i'm gonna base my approach on all my training and then that's i think that's gonna set you up for failure um because you're going to say okay well my training involves this kind of attack this kind of attack this kind of attack no matter how much you train any one attack or any any combination of moves Chances are, in a self-defense situation, somebody's going to give you something you've never seen before, um, and then and then you might just run into a problem. And then, but once you're cut or shot, you're 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 not going to be doing too well um, uh, because you're a little overconfident. But if you're if you're stuck moving backwards and you're stuck in a room like I'm in a small office, um, and you know it's between me and the door, and I have to get to him, well, yeah, I'm going to grab a chair. You know, I'm going to run into the wall. I'm going to, you know, um, throw, a, throw a keyboard at him, you know. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use whatever I can. You know, I'll take my shoe off and put it on my hand and start defending my hand from a knife attack or whatever. So, so yeah, we don't we don't want to go head in on a, on a self-defense scenario if we if we can help it, for sure. So yeah. mentality, is, mentality is key when you're, when you're defending versus fighting. Yeah. Another thing on that same line to remember is um, as long as your confidence comes from someplace that's beyond your physical ability, you'll have confidence to do what you need to do in a difficult situation. And yeah. mm -hmm. they've done studies that if people just band together and bum rush the attacker, a lot of times they can, they can wrestle the weapon from them. Maybe someone get shot, you know, on the way in. I was just uh, listening to- Like a an active shooter situation, you mean, right? Yeah, you know, I was listening to a story, of, like three guys who they were kind of like, the active shooter was here and they were here and everyone was kind of like out here and they could have ran away, but they were kind of in between like being safe to run away and being close <laughs> enough to intercept. And they were all buddies. I think they were on like a wrestling team or something. And they were like, let's go. And they all just charged the guy. And they all survived. And the doc awesome. around and removed his weapon. And um, there's a lot of uh, other stories I've heard in the past of people just basically kind of just having extreme aggression and just going straight at the attacker. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it just one person unless you were trying to save your family or somebody. And it was like the only way to do that. And I'm certainly willing to take that that uh, that risk for my family. But you know, if you had superior numbers, uh, a few good people can do a lot. And one of the main reasons why everyone gets murdered by a mass shooter is that everyone's just terrified and no one's willing to actually confront them in an intelligent way. Um, Which is tough. Yeah, yeah. Because if you have 16 people in a crowd and all 16 people just ran at the shooter, he might kill a few people, but you would eventually overwhelm him and take his weapon away from him. Um, but the problem is that everyone's out for themselves, and so everyone just runs away. And that's why yeah. in the military, we, we teach that discipline uh, to do brave things as a team, uh, because when it's if it's you know every man for himself, it just leads to chaos and people getting murdered. Yeah, it's all unfortunate, and um, you know, yeah, having having the confidence to to approach. It sounds like you're. Uh your story you're talking about with the three wrestling buddies um they they 
they, like you said, they, they had the opportunity to get away, but it was potentially in the line of fire. So they thought the best way to get through and over this whole scenario was to attack. So it doesn't sound like they attacked willingly, but in, in a self-defense mentality, meaning we have to do this. We have no choice. You know what I mean? Um, as opposed to playing hero, right? As opposed to saying, oh, you know what? Let's go save. Let's go save everybody. Um, and going in with, with overconfidence and trying to, to do the stuff that you see on movies all the time, you know? So, so that... I'm glad that really worked out for sure. Um, that, that happened with the airliner, though. You know, that was going to crash into the Pentagon, right, during 9-11. Those, those guys mm -hmm. rushed the cockpit. I mean, can you imagine, like, the, that tiny little alleyway? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's just machine, know. You know, right. very hard to get through there without getting shot. And they rushed in there and they mm -hmm. uh, crashed that plane so that they didn't kill a bunch of people. Right. And 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 the uh, last thing I wanted to, to to talk about was was stress inoculation. You know, um, you know, uh, you know, knowing that there's a sharp blade coming at you, knowing that there's a firearm, that's like maximum stress uh, for anybody. You know, no matter how skilled and experienced you are, that is stress. And um, uh, training in a way that uh, um, exposes you to that kind of stress and just get you more comfortable being in that stress, hence the reason for, um, you know, ground grappling. It puts you in an extreme state of stress, and you have to operate. So you can practice all you want, but then once somebody actually starts coming at you full bore, you know, now it's going to hit you, and your 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 uh, brain's going to shut down and go, oh, crap, now I don't really know what to do. I forgot all my training, you know. So we need that little bit of stress inoculation <clears throat> to, to reinforce uh, you know, all of the stuff that we're learning, make sure that it's written in, in our subconscious as opposed to just in our frontal cortex. And we're just like constantly thinking about what to do next. We want to, we want to act in a way that, that is more natural. So, so in the, in that plane scenario, for example, yeah, it's a small little aisle, but I mean, they, uh, I think, I think the reports were like, all they have was box cutters, you know, mm -hmm. and box cutters, I mean, super razor sharp, right? They're using razors, but, but, I mean, that's that's nothing compared to some of the weaponry we see out there. Right. It wasn't a rifle. It wasn't it wasn't anything big. But mm -hmm. but that shows you know, hun uh, over 100 people, 150 people, whoever was on that airliner, only a, only a couple had the um, had the audacity to be able to do anything about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe from prior training, maybe it was an air marshal, maybe there was something going on there, but. And you need to overcome that in some aspects, um, and they did. Thankfully, uh, they were able to do something. Yeah. But most most other people, they they just don't know what to do, and and even if they did, they might be overcome with with the stress, you know. And and, and somebody like you and I, we might see a box cutter as like, oh, okay, well, you're you're trying to hijack this plane with me and my family on it, okay. and you have a box cutter. That's all you got. You're going to need a lot more than that. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, uh, but then again, I'm 6'3", you know, um, and I, I'm, you guys are pretty big as well. So, uh, you know, um, you know, so I, I, I'm, I'm taller and bigger than average and I'm pretty confident that if we're in a small aisle and you're depending on a box cutter to save your life, I'm, I'm pretty sure I have a more of an advantage, you know, I'm, I'm going to do some bad things, uh, uh, to you to, to, in order to, to, to save me and my family who's on that plane. Um, of course, I'm thinking about it in retrospect. Back in 2001, I was 17 with no training. You know, I did backyard wrestling. That's about it. <laughs> you know, so, so it wasn't like I was very um, thing. But over time, uh, we grow as martial artists. Mm -hmm. We gain certain levels of confidence and uh, sense of reality. And we understand that, that weapons training is super important. Um, and if you've never done weapons training, uh, we, we highly recommend it just because, um, you know, your, uh, your grappling experience, your wrestling, your, uh, you know, your karate, your tank sudo, whatever it is, and you've never touched a weapon before or had a weapon thrusted at you in any kind of a real scenario, uh, it's going to really change your day, you know, so um, sure. it just changes everything, you know, we weapons and grappling, especially, you know, we have to adjust our mindset super quick. And all that flashy stuff that people do on the ground um, that I, I I commend them on because they're just so good at it. All that goes out the window the moment I pull out a knife on you, you know, and it's it's really unfortunate. So you have to you have to take me out pretty quickly. Um, but then again, I'm trained as well, so it's not like you know. Um, 
but but you don't want to be in that situation where the guy pulls a knife out and stabs you while you're trying to get a choke on. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it's just uh, uh, we we just have to understand that that's a realistic pro- possibility and and to expect that, and then we have to know roughly what to do grossly um, if if we're presented with that. Yeah. So. Yep. Yes, sir. I mean, yeah, I totally agree. Diversity in training is very important. I don't know who said it, moder- all things in moderation or something. So. But I feel like that's so true with life, with everything in life. But it's also true with martial arts. You know, you, you have to know a little bit about everything to really be able to defend yourself. Um, and, you know, you can have, I mean, I don't know what, you can have a great grappler, you know, And a lot of those guys, they've never been punched in the face. They've never incorporated punching into their grappling. They don't realize that in the early days of no holds barred fighting, a lot of people were losing to testicles getting squeezed and eyes getting gouged out. And there's a lot of striking and, and, you know, potentially stabbing with a knife and all this kind of stuff that can happen in that grappling confine. Uh, that really changes the dynamic of how you fight and what you can do. And so it's important to mix things up and to uh, mm-hmm. have those different experiences. Absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I also recommend that people who do sport um, sport arts, like like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, uh, to, to explore traditional Japanese Jiu-Jitsu or... Um, you know, uh, MMA or something, something that's a little more to the point, uh, you know, in, in traditional jujitsu, Japanese jujitsu, um, the, the, the focus is to, yeah, we want to grapple, we want to learn how to do throws, you know, we want to learn how to do all that fun stuff. But the end goal of jujitsu was to take the opponent down so that we can take them out, not, not to, uh, not to just, choke out on the ground or do an arm bar. You'd never, we, even though we, we learn how to do that, we don't, we don't do that as often. Um, you know, we, we use strikes in the middle of a grapple. We'll, we'll use um, chokes and um, locks that aren't readily seen in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competition. Yeah. And the reason you don't see them is because people are going to lose fingers. You know, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to have a thumb jammed behind their, you know, their, um, you know, their, their, uh, their trachea. They're going to have, um, um, you know, eyes, you know, eyes gouged, like you said, you know, even incidentally, that happened to me, um, you know, about 12 years ago with my guy who actually teaches me Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now because we kind of switched schools. And, um, uh, you know, we were grappling way back then and he jammed me in the eye and that, that works. I mean, he, I let go real quick. I got, you know, it was, it was, it was incidental, but, um, yeah, but yeah, I let go real quick. And, um, um, uh, and it's just important for people to understand that the game changes when the rules change. Yeah. So if you're not used to getting hit, you know, approach that in your training. Just so you know, look, this person might get a hit off me. I need to know how it feels or I need to know what to expect um, you know, just from that kind of mentality. Because not everybody wants to roll the way that you roll at school. You know, not everybody's going to play nice, if you will. You know, and um, you don't have to worry about somebody breaking your arm. You don't have to worry about somebody cutting you in class. You don't have to worry about somebody shooting you in class. You don't have to worry about somebody hitting you with a stick in class or kicking you really, really hard in class. But you have to worry about all that in the street. So we need to keep a realistic expectation of our training across the board, you know, like you said, you know, with um, diversity. Um, and that goes with stress inoculation too, you know, the, the fear that that comes along with with that stress for sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can keep talking. I got a lot yes, of sir. Yes, stuff, sir. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate you guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on, sir. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, much appreciated. Buttons and um, we'll have to have you back on sometime. And talk some, about something else. Of yes, course, sir. no problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Take care, sir. Okay. Thank you, guys. If you enjoyed that podcast, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, as well as hitting the notification bell. We offer in-person group and private lessons at our facility in Kyle, Texas, as well as virtual lessons anywhere in the world. If you'd like to learn more about our programs, you can find us online at risingphoenixtkd.com.